Thanks. Look at this. Lori, is this making your day? Two thumbs up, except what your microphone's in one of your hands. <laughs> a microphone and a thumbs up. Okay, so a very warm welcome to our closing panel for our TESS 2024 conference. We have Dr. Lori Harrison. I'm going to introduce Lori. And Lori is then going to ask the panel to introduce themselves. So Lori's Director of Digital Learning Innovation at U of T, and she's also an eCampus board member and such a distinguished career in digital pedagogies, faculty development, learning innovation, data-driven design, flexible learning, so much more at U of T. And on a personal note, Laura, you are one of the most informed, thoughtful, insightful readers in this sector that I know. So please join me in welcoming Lori and our amazing panel to introduce everything and learn about transformation in faculty development, generative AI. Thank you very much. We've got a mic working? Okay, great. Thank you very much. And um, thanks for that introduction. I'm um, a little bit flattered and a little embarrassed and unhumbled, yes, uh, to be here. I am a board member and uh, I'm proud to, to congratulate eCampus on the program they had offered us over the last two days. So uh, my, my thanks to them and in this auspicious building, uh, iconic in terms of, of a learning environment here in the Toronto Public Library, it's great to be here. So yes, uh, yesterday, if you were here, you heard um, that Robert and company were trying to claim that they were the the, fin the finale panel, the finale panale, but uh, that's Terry Green's term, we'll give him the hat tip for that. But no, we are actually the finale panale here. And I thank all of you for staying with us and still being here for this closing session today. Now, I don't think I need to repeat, I would be a little bit Captain Obvious if I, I continue to wax poetical about the, uh, you know, obvious disruptive experiences we've been having on the, the front line of teaching and learning over the past couple of years since Gen AI became available to the public. But if we go back a little farther in time, you know, through the 20 teens, um, a lot of us were trying to get up to speed just with online learning and we had to, you know, rise to the occasion as the province was shifting in a new direction. And then lo and behold, here came 2020 and we all had the whiplash from the, the pandemic pivot that hit us pretty hard. And just when you thought, you might catch a breath of, of you know, a chance to breathe. Uh, here comes Gen AI. And so now we have had our latest jolt of uncertainty about our digital futures to take the, the terms of the foresight team. So, um, you know, when the going gets tough, uh, the tough turn to some of their best colleagues for a little bit of uh, empathy and also some advice. And so you're probably wondering if you're gonna get any good advice here today. Uh, who are these people? Uh, why are we here? So let me tell you a little bit uh, about these folks and who they are. Here's the backstory. We are all part of USEL, which is the Ontario University Council on E-Learning. We're a professional network of learners and we have a long tradition of um, crossing institutional boundaries to share uh, know-how and strategy around whatever is the latest innovation. So these folks are really agents of change. They're often situated between uh, policymakers and the provost's office and the instructors on the front line. And um, there's often very different attitudes, people of different persuasion about whether generative AI is a great thing or something perhaps to be quite nervous about. I wonder if how many of you find yourself in that same place. Uh, so between the, the directions that come from above on the policies and programs and initiatives and directives that you should implement, and then the reality of having to make those so uh, in the workplace in our, in our institutions across the province. So it's true to say that they are really um, engaged in digital transformation on a daily basis. And I also think that um, you'll find that these individuals are people who lead from where they are. And I think that's a little bit about the theme of our panel today is what can you do from where you're situated in an institution? As they navigate any number of competing priorities, we know uh, we have access, we have cost, we have quality, we have all these things in the, the iron triangle of education that we're trying to balance. So like me, you're probably looking forward to getting some good advice and insights from this group uh, with diverse perspectives from across the universities. So I'm actually going to invite them. And um, there's four of us. You can see Nick larger than life there on the screen. Hello, Nick. Can Nick see us? Can we wave at Nick? I don't know if he can see us, but we're all waving at you, Nick. That's the described video for today. Um, <laughs> so what I'm going to do is uh, first ask the panelists to talk a little bit about some of the challenges they're seeing 
ask them then uh, to share a key strategy uh, that's been successful for them. And then we're going to round it out with sharing some news you can use, practical stuff that you can use in your own institutions. So uh, let's start uh, nearest. Uh, I'm going to invite Aaron Aspenleader, who is the special advisor to the provost on generative AI and the office of the provost and vice president at McMaster University to introduce herself, uh, tell us a, a little bit about her role at the institution and then within that context, how she engages in uh, support and the challenges she's seeing with the rapid impacts of Gen AI. So over to you, Erin. Thanks so much, Lori. And thanks everyone for being here. Hi, Nick. Um, my job title, Special Advisor to the Provost on Generative AI, will surprise none of you that that was a generative AI invented job title. <laughs> the way I want to describe my work is also the way I want to describe the challenge that I think we're facing. And I'm going to try to tell it uh, by way of a parable in a couple of minutes. You might be familiar with the parable of the, um, the people who encounter an elephant and the people who meet the elephant are blindfolded. And one person is given the trunk of the elephant and they hold the trunk and they feel it and they describe it as a snake. They say, this is it's a rough, long, twisty, sinewy um, snake. Another person blindfolded is given the ear of the elephant and they describe it as velvety and soft and thin and wide. And somebody else is touching the tail and it's bristly and thin and somebody else is given a foot. And of course it's thick and um, covered in toenails and they're describing that. And each of them is convinced that they know um, what the elephant is and they're telling one another, here's the elephant. It's this like snake-like thing. It's this thick thing. It's this sinewy thing. And they're arguing with one another. You've gotten it wrong. You don't understand the problem. And that has been my experience of generative AI, both in the role that I'm in, which is one trying to take a view of the entire elephant and trying to talk to people who are holding different parts of that problem and trying to help them see there is a huge problem in front of us that is not just the section that you are holding, but beyond teaching and learning, I think as a sector, we are encountering the generative AI elephant and as a society and as a, as a globe, um, we're facing that enormous scale of disruption and seeing it often um, where it's impacting us as individuals. And the challenge I'm encountering with faculty members is they're being told to address that problem as individuals. You need to get some AI literacy. You need to learn how to prompt. You need to experiment with these tools. And it's not an individual problem. It's not an institutional problem. It's not a sector-wide problem. It's something that needs coordinated, collaborative, um, widespread energy. And so that's what I'm hoping um, we can do. Great. Thank you so much, Erin. That's a great insight. And I'm familiar with that parable too. And it's it's a good one in this situation, it suits. I think we'll go alphabetically and as not to privilege folks in the room, I'm actually going to call on Nick next to introduce himself in that beautiful location that he's uh, <laughs> apparently in and uh, share with us the challenge that you've noted. Thanks so much. And I uh, really appreciate um the opportunity to come in remotely as well. I really wish I could be there with you guys, but uh, unfortunately things didn't pan out. And unfortunately I'm also not sitting on Crete where this photo was taken. Um, I am in Windsor uh, where I'm the director of the Office of Open Learning and currently the co-chair of the Senate Academic Policy Committee Subcommittee on AI. And unlike Aaron's, that wasn't made up by uh, AI that was made up by a committee, as you might have also told. Um, and I also sit across uh, onto the second committee that that we have institutionally, which is uh, an operational excellence committee, which is looking at kind of all of the operational components. Uh, and I think Aaron's kind of description of the challenge that we face is is spot on. It's perfect. Um, I'm going to suggest that for a smaller institution like us, there are some challenges that we face that you know perhaps don't uh, resonate as much elsewhere but one of those is the fact we don't have a dedicated resource that we don't have an errand position and uh, I'm doing all of this work off the side of my desk it's on top of everything else that I do um, and there's not really any ownership taken institutionally of this big elephant that's in the room with us and uh and the elephant's starting to break things and someone needs to kind of get a hold of it. Uh, so I'm trying to do that from a place of very little kind of power resource. 
Um, one of the other big challenges for us is we don't have a data governance structure. So any data that we'd like to feed the elephant uh, is inaccessible or it's in forms that don't work or the, we don't actually know who owns it and we don't really want to feed it to the animal and get what comes out the other end. <laughs> um, and, and I think the third thing that's really impacting us is that there's still just so much unwillingness to critically engage. There is this kind of issue of people thinking that it's going to go away or it's not going to touch my discipline or how could it possibly, you know, impact me apart, apart from those cheating students. Um, and, and you see it, you see that kind of challenge in the response from industry because industry is running so far ahead of us on this. Uh, we're being kind of left behind and we're not in the conversations that we need to be. We've got some catching up to do. So uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Nick. Nick tells it like it is. Thank you, Nick. Larger than life on the screen, I might add, as he usually is. Okay. Uh, so then following in alphabetical, we have Jordan Holmes. Uh, Jordan has the office right next to me at U of T, so we're pretty good buds. Uh, he's the Senior Manager of Teaching, Learning, and Technology at the Center for Teaching, Support, and Innovation at U of T. Uh, thanks for that, Lori. Um, maybe just a bit about what CTSI is, or the Center for Teaching, Support, and Innovation. So U of T, um, I joined U of T in January um, after about 15 years at a very small institution. So joining U of T um, was a bit of a culture shock. Um, and what I quickly learned is that things are very distributed, right? It's very, it's very big, <laughs> spread out over Scarborough, Mississauga and the St. George downtown campus. So CTSI is a central teaching and learning center, but we have many other teaching and learning centers distributed across U of T. You know, many of my colleagues here from um, arts and science are here today. They have a very robust teaching and learning center. Um, we have uh, other colleagues from faculty of uh, applied science and engineering. Similarly, a uh, very robust teaching and learning uh, uh, center. And I would say, uh, you know, being situated in a, in a central, in the central teaching and learning center, you know, we get a lot of inquiries from a, a great uh, diversity of people who are engaging with generative AI. So I think one of, <laughs> one of the first questions I got, or one of the first emails I got when I joined, this was in, in January, somebody asked me, oh, how do I get uh, API access to a uh, generative AI system? I'm building a bot. And I was like, uh, I got, I, I've got co-pilot. Is that, is, is, can you want to, do you want to co-pilot? So we've got, we've got, um, you know, a very passionate base of instructors and researchers who are wanting us to go faster. They want, um, you know, custom API access. They want a very stable, secure, all the privacy and security infrastructure in place. And I would say in general, their perspective on generative AI is, um, for the most part, positive. You know, they see, you know, how it's being uptaken in the in the workforce. They see that this is kind of something that the sector, and you know, as Aaron mentioned, that the whole world has to grapple with, and that this is kind of an, an inevitable thing that we have to deal with. Then, on the other end of the spectrum, we have many faculty, um, you know, often in our humanities sectors, um, who are bringing a very essential perspective as well. The more that they hear about generative AI, the less that they're enthused about it. They're pointing to very real concerns about, um, you know, the impact on their discipline, the impact on the future of the professions. They're thinking about, um, you know, very real impacts of, um, you know, environmental impacts, ethical impacts, and they want us to go slower. <laughs> they want us to be engaging in a critical AI literacy. And then we have, you know, instructors who are in between who, um, you know, kind of don't know what they don't know yet. They're, they're, they're still getting sensitized to what is this thing. They're, they're kind of feeling around the elephant and what, what is this thing? So we're, we're uh, spending a lot of our time as well thinking about, okay, what are the, what are the foundational pieces of generative AI literacy um, from a programming perspective that we need to build um, and how do we support them too? And on top of it, everybody is is upset that um, plagiarism detection isn't possible <laughs> with generative AI. So just add that on. Sorry, the breaking the news. If you hadn't heard <laughs> yeah, that so news. far, it's, it's snake oil. The harsh reality that we're all facing here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, thank you, Jordan. And then finally, uh, please welcome Patrick Mayer. He's the professor, uh, professor in the School of Physical Health Education at Manipsing University. 
Thanks, Lori. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. And I sort of chuckle at the fact that Nick called his university small um, because we're even smaller. So using the uh, elephant analogy, I really feel like the mouse, right? Dancing around the foot of this giant elephant in the room. So my current role um, is as a faculty member. So I'm a, a professor in the School of Physical and Health Education. Where am I in this conversation? Whoa. Where am I in this conversation right now? I'm on sabbatical. So I'm sort of dancing around foot long and fancy free. But at the start of the kind of generative AI conversation in 2022, um, I was the Dean of Teaching. And this just felt like we're just going to, it's a tidal wave, right? We've just come out from the pandemic when I became the Dean of Blackboard, much to everyone's chagrin. And now I was the Dean of Generative AI. I needed to solve everyone's AI problems immediately, just like I needed to solve their pivot problems uh, two years earlier immediately. And I think for us, um, one of the things that we realized with the pandemic and then took into the conversation about generative AI is we're, we're small. We don't have the capacity to solve this. So we really do need to lean on our colleagues at much larger global institutions that are tackling this head on. But we also can't put our head in the sand and ignore this because generative AI is here but how can we right size it? Or how can my office at that time, my office um, sort of leverage it or put it into perspective for Nipissing University, unlike a U of T or a McMaster, for example. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Pat, for sharing the most perspective, diverse perspectives here on the stage today. Uh, thanks for that round from the panel. And we're going to move on now to our second question. So we looked at the challenge, you know, a little bit of the cloud side, but um, we're going to take a little bit of a turn now, and uh, this is a very resilient group of panelists. So they've all been instrumental in building capacity within their instructor communities. And so for this next round's responses, we're going to ask each of them to share a key successful strategy they found valuable in leading from where they are. And as a uh, responsible moderator, I'm going to ask you all to snap it up a little bit. So <laughs> we'll just pick up the pace a little. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Do you want, I will go first. Sure, repeat the order. Um, it won't come as a surprise to anyone in the room. You are all doing this too. You are all in so many ways, I'm sure, leading from where you are around generative AI. And so the strategy that I'm going to suggest is partnership. Um, it is partnership with our students. And so McMaster has a long established students as partners program. And we are um, working towards a project where students suggest the projects that would help them um, respond to AI and working with faculty and staff around that. Our governance approach at McMaster has been one of partnership among teaching and learning research and operations. So our AI advisory committee is partners of our most senior leaders who might not always um, have the same mission mandate and goals in their discrete areas, partnering to try to solve and address some of um, those thorny challenges. It's partnership among service units who might historically touch once or twice, but our teaching and learning center working so closely with the library, with the academic integrity officer, with the office of legal services. I didn't even know we had an office of legal services, but then people start asking questions about copyright and you're like, that's yes, we need a, that's helpful. Um, the privacy office, our student union, um, there's not a way to address the opportunity here that does not involve lots of us working together. And then that's outside of McMaster. So taking advantage of peer institutions um, where there are colleagues and networks to say, please let's not build this by ourselves. So everything that McMaster has built, we have made open. Um, you can adapt, use, you can take what Kyle Mackey and I developed in guidebooks and you can use it on your own. Um, you can, any of our modules go forth, but more of that partnership is necessary. We need um, we need broad leadership to help us figure out not just how to assess, but what should we be teaching um, in a moment where there's, yeah, the shifting grounds of what counts as uh, learning and knowledge is. I'm going to pass it over. I don't want to get too dark too fast. <laughs> this is supposed to be the more optimistic right, part of the panel here. It's Sorry. a hard, a hard day to conjure optimism. That's I'll be honest. True. I, we're sympathetic there. Um, I think we'll pass it back to Nick on location. Uh, if you will, Nick, over yeah. to you. So I'll build on that and say that I think that you need to think about um, impact at 
different levels in the institution, that there are ways in which you need to engage that uh, make sense to different parts of the institution. So at the institutional level, I think having a position like Aaron's or like Mark Daly's at Western are absolutely critical to moving stuff forward. Um, because even though it may not actually cost you a whole lot, what it does is send a signal to the institution that this is something that we value, this is something that we think is important and that we need to address. Um, <clears throat> I think at the moment, none of us should be locking in huge vendor contracts on AI, not that any of us have the money to do that anyway, but, um, but I think therein lies a path to terrible outcomes. I think we need to be leaning on each other, like Aaron was saying, uh, the the work from York around Aura, Cogniti from University of Sydney, those are ways in which we can actually build and use tools that make sense to our local context and do so pretty cheaply. Like, honestly, this is, a, this is the only way we get to affordability in this. And that builds us towards universal access in ways that we can kind of manage that are, you know, safer than some of the other things that are out there. I think it's absolutely important to have communities of exploration and practice um, you know, building on each other's uh, fears and challenges and bringing people together so that they in a space where they can talk about those things. We've found that that's been generating some amazing ideas, cross-pollination of ways in which you can utilize these tools. And I think going down to the more individual or, or lower levels in the in the community, we've got to think about, we're at a point now where the kind of initial shock has worn off and people are starting to see potential and risks for their particular areas. And it's actually a point where we can start to have conversations at disciplinary levels. So what does it mean for my program? What does it mean for my discipline? These are the kind of conversations that have been already going on in Australia and you know the UK and Ireland, where they're thinking about across a program, what does it mean for that program? What does it mean for a curriculum? And, uh, and I think we're starting to see space mm -hmm. for that now because that's the place where we really make impact at this point. Thank you, Nick, for that insight. And it, it reminds me of a comment yesterday that we we don't want to have generative AI done like done to us. Um, we need to be in the driver's seat around our, our journey and own our journey. And um, I really, really, uh, your comments resonate with me, Nick. Thanks for those. And over to Jordan. Um, thanks, Lori. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of a story. Uh, we, uh, I, I remember meeting with one of my uh, esteemed colleagues from uh, Faculty of Arts and Science. And this was during the time where I, I think, you know, with every sort of disruptive thing that comes, there's there's uh, always kind of a, uh, you know, so many webinars to go to, and you kind of get to the webinar fatigue after a while. And we, we were uh, both uh, talking about a webinar that we just went to, and um, from from her positionality, she's also an instructor and she's a, also an educational developer. She was saying and reflecting on the key advice that was in this webinar of like, you know, you have to rethink all your assessments. You know, all your assessments are basically, you throw them in the garbage, you know? And she was saying that was so condescending and so Pollyanna of like, how is it even possible to just throw away all of your assessments? And that brought me right back to the, you know, early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I immediately went back to, to my colleague, uh, Tori, uh, who's our uh, educational developer in um, uh, generative AI pedagogies. And we had a conversation like, ooh, we gotta, we gotta tone down on the rhetoric around re <laughs> rethinking all of your assessments. And that linked us really to another strategy that we've been really trying to embrace. And this is around, um, our approach and strategic approach to UDL. And I was talking to another colleague and I, I think one of the, the key uh, strategies here is to have a lot of smart people to talk to. Um, <laughs> and she was saying, oh, you know what? This is, this is perfectly in line with something that we talk about in UDL of a concept called plus one. Like don't boil the ocean, pick one thing that is very doable and achievable within the context of a running of a course, do that and forget about everything else, that's enough. And I think, you know, going with that um, philosophy has been really uh, a critical piece of the success of our faculty development programming. Great, thanks so much, Jordan, for the plus one. Appreciate it. Pat, over to you. Yeah, and I just wanna um, sort of reiterate some things that, that my esteemed panelists have already said. Um, 
as I said before, um, our capacity was an issue as a small institution. And so our successful strategy was really to utilize the work of others and leverage that and put it into Nipissing University speak. Um, because I think like all other institutions, you sort of had 50% who said, you need to fix this for me now. I need the tools to do this now. And the other 50% who said, well, we don't want the tools until the policy is done and developed. And we kind of had to run up the middle. And so we really looked for, um, you know, this was in December 2022 through to June 2023 when we put out some guides. Um, we really looked to who was active in this space, who was constantly updating their, their information about generative AI. So, so we used a lot of what um, the University College of London had put together, the University of Calgary had put together, and we built those into our guides because we thought we don't have the capacity to refresh this all the time, but at least we can put the links in there that are constantly getting um, refreshed and that will help our faculty get through this. So it's a little bit of practice versus policy. And the other thing with the guides that we produced, um, it was about the teaching side and the learning side. So there were lots of institutions that were putting out, hey, instructors, here's what you need to do with regards to generative AI. But there weren't a lot of places that were saying, hey, students, here's what you need to do with regards to generative AI. And we had one of our staff in the teaching hub go and try and search for some resources. And they found hundreds of resources all about how to cheat with generative AI so that they didn't find any constructive um, as a student, here's what you might consider. So I think those are some important points. And the last piece that I wanted to mention goes down the, the road that Nick uh, was talking about, the program or discipline specific level. So, so I come from outdoor education, a very hands-on, we hate technology sort of discipline. But actually, there's a recent article out uh, in one of our premier journals about how is generative AI going to affect outdoor education. So mm -hmm. shameless plug for an article that I'm an author on in the Journal of Adventure Education and Outdoor mm -hmm. Learning. Great. Thank you very much, Pat. And I think that's a good insight that we, we've been a little bit slow to come up with those student facing resources, um, you know, just getting over the shock as Jordan say, and, but that may be uh, something that's going to be increasingly important for us to hone that and find out how we can uh, best make resources that are not only targeting our instructors around curriculum design, but also our, our students around their digital literacy and their learning skills, leveraging generative AI. So now this brings us to the news you can use portion of our program. Um, I, we, we do have a, a slide for this. Um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to make Nick disappear from the, the screen there. I don't know if our AV team can do something magical here and show the, uh, PowerPoint and, uh, then come back to Nick, uh, or else we'll do, oh, look at that. Aren't they brilliant? Here we go. Um, so I'm just going to say this, this screen, um, has, oh, it's missing a link from Windsor, but we'll get that to you. Um, we we talked about sharing resources and what we ended up with are are for the most part the main resource sites for our respective institutions and certainly you can go and browse and find a lot of great stuff there so um by all means grab that qr code and go browsing but the challenge that i wanted to put to our panelists today is to identify from within the wealth of um, the materials that you're sharing to pick out something that they want to highlight for you and tell you about that they think is particularly exceptional or exemplary in the materials that their team has developed that might be equally um, useful to you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one more round and I guess we'll stick with the order because it's working well for us. Um, so I'm gonna ask Erin to go first. For sure, thank you so much. Um, so the McMaster resource I wanted to highlight is one called the assessment partner. Um, so speaking to Pat's challenge of, or Jordan's, don't, don't ask all me to redesign challenge. all of our assessments. Um, we built a generative AI based tool, the assessment partner that redesigns your assessments. So you can start from scratch, build me a brand new assessment. You can take an existing assessment and adapt it. It's a multi-agent tool that uses multiple foundation models to check accuracy in the back end. It's open access, help yourself um, use it. It is, however, in a proof of concept stage. So if you all open it right now, it will crash. Um, so please like space your experimentation. And we are really um, eager for feedback from faculty, from students um, on how we can continue to improve the assessment partner. I'm gonna suggest we break the pattern and keep the slide up. We'll maybe move through the panelists on stage and then we'll come back to you, Nick. 
Thanks, Lori. Um, I think uh, if you navigate to the, the U of T, um, the Teaching with Generative AI uh, resource there, we have a, a section there called Generative AI Tools. And there's a really, um, what uh, we use quite a bit, <laughs> we're quite proud of, um, that is a section that kind of outlines our philosophy of kind of what's in what we call the walled garden of supported educational technology. And then what would we think about that's outside of the walled garden? So, you know, with most of the generative AI tools that our instructors are really eager about playing with, they're outside of this walled garden. So we've developed a bit of a framework for instructors to um, think about you know, how might I think about privacy and security? What might I need to ask myself about uh, the EULA and what do, do I need to examine about that? How might I think about um, student equity and access? Can I make this assessment? What do I have to put on my syllabus? All of those kinds of things to consider for instructors as a bit of a, uh, as a, bit of a guide. Um, so you may find that to be a useful resource if you're thinking about ways to frame you know, what's um, kind of institutionally supported and what um, what is kind of outside of that uh, nice walled garden. Thank you, Jordan. Um, that's a, a resource that I point people to a lot as well. So hope you find it useful too. Pat. Yeah, so the resources, I've already mentioned them, but it's our guides for instructors and students. Um, and like I said, the student one, it was difficult to find external resources that didn't point to cheating. Um, if you go to the instructor's guide, um, I think the the links are still you know equally valid today as they were in June 2023 when we first put these together. Um, they do point to that teaching with generative AI at U of T um, webpage, just like they point to the the UCL and the University of Calgary. Um, I think the important point there is, you know, for for a small university with limited capacity we got pretty quick to having some guides out there. They're not policy. They're not exactly what you should do. They're best practice at the time of June, 2023. And so we felt like we were really riding the crest of the wave there. Um, and unfortunately for a variety of restructuring and financial issues, those have sort of sat for over a year, but I think they're equally valid now. And partially that's because we we're smart and we leverage the fact that UCL, U Calgary and U of T would keep updating over the next 12 months. So enjoy. Thank you, Pat, for that evergreening strategy. Okay, so I'll ask the AV folks to take that down and now we're back to Nick on the screen. Yeah, so our strategy was kind of similar to Pat's as well. Um, ours has only really just recently gone up, but uh, we've got a kind of developed a hub that is sort of built around the McMaster model where it's a guidance for the whole campus, um, starting with a set of principles. So we took a principles-based approach rather than policy. We looked at our policies and said, actually, we have all the policies we already need. Um, we just need to apply them in the way that we would. This is just another application of that. So I think one of the things that's useful on there for faculty and students right now, and there's a staff one coming, there are, there's kind of a one-page visual uh, outline of, of key considerations for you at this point. Um, and we keep updating them as things change, but that's, we found that most people wouldn't read the advice or the content or, you know, the policies if we had them. Uh, so that kind of one, that very short approach is really important. I think the other thing you'll see popping up there soon is our, our new project on AI on a shoestring, which is how to do this if you have absolutely no money. Great. Thank you very much, Nick, for sharing those insights. So that's our, our structured uh, questions. Now we have a few different options that we can have now. Uh, so here's the plan. First, we're going to open it up. And if you have a couple of questions that you want to ask, we'll take questions. But I'm also going to turn it around in a few minutes and I'm going to ask you a question which is with the brain trust we have here in this room, I am sure that some of you have some strategies that you might like to share or resources that you might like to share. So you can think about that for a minute, whether you have something you'd like to share while we take our first couple of questions. So it's a little bit reciprocal here. Uh, we act as a community of practice at USEL, so we're gonna kind of like model that here and see if we can get the questions going both ways and the information sharing both ways. And it looks like Jenny has a question. She has her hand up, or maybe she has a strategy to share. We don't know, but. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great conversation and, and hearing all the different ideas. One of the things that occurs to me while you're talking is that we, as institutions, 
we already have a plan. It's called our strategic plan. We have it. We're supposed to be like aligning all the things that we do with that strategic plan. Likely, unless you've done it within the past year or two, it does not include AI specifically, but can, are there ways to find, and, and probably you have done a bit of this exercise, ways to ensure that anything you're considering or the faculty bring to you, or that actually you can turn it around and say, which part of our strategic plan does this align with? And how can we make it a priority? Because it feels like AI is this enormous thing that needs prioritization somehow, which is really hard, but might the strategic plan help? Thank, thanks for that question, Jenny. I'm tempted to answer it myself, <laughs> if I may be so bold, if I can have the indulgence of the panel. So this morning, you might have noticed that I might not have been here for the first session this morning because I was back at U of T facilitating strategic planning processes uh, in our IT group. And we had the good fortune to be refreshing our strat plan right now, but we actually didn't insert generative AI as an item in the plan. It is not one of our goals. It is not a goal. It is a tool. It is a way of working. So we are conceptualized it as something that's a lens or something you, you know you cast across all of the activities. And I think that's what you're saying, Jenny, in a way. And I would also reverse that, that on the one hand, you might think, oh, this is something new. How am I going to get the resources to now integrate this into what I'm doing? But on the other hand, it's also a, a pretty good magnet for resources right now. So if you're trying to get resources, uh, a, consideration of a particular project by including a generative AI aspect to it, maybe a way to get some attention and resources uh, in, a, in a quite a sleight of hand in terms of uh, leading from where you are. That would be my insight du jour. Does anybody want to build on that from the, or Nick? Uh, maybe I could add one thing, Lori, and I think um, another way to look at this as well is if there are other upcoming institutional priorities or strategies, one thing that we're really trying to be thoughtful about paying attention to is how might these intersect and how can we build on the momentum that we've got going, you know, with resources being directed towards generative AI and how might those help other priorities too. One that comes to mind immediately for me is the, um, you know, uh, accessibility and the upcoming, uh, you know, uh, AODA requirements that will be in place as of January 1st. Um, none of us are ready for this. I think that's quite, <laughs> I don't think I'm, I'm spilling any beans there, but, um, you know, just for example, one of the reflections that we've had in working with um, custom virtual tutors or AI bots is that, you know what, like a lot of the, the content cleaning that we need to do for those is really the same thing that we should be doing for making documents accessible. Looking at very specifically and paying attention to the information hierarchy within a document so that it'll be parsable um, and interpretable by a, a generative AI model. It's also very helpful for from an accessibility perspective. So it's, you know, people aren't so excited about about you know the massive work that's upcoming in making documents accessible, but maybe we can build on that enthusiasm by looking at it from like a generative AI angle as well. Potential generative AI curb cut there. Any other questions before I ask you questions? Come on. Okay, I'm gonna ask, oh, 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 there's one, I've got one right into the wire there, I love it. Um, <laughs> my question is, uh, with all of you deep diving into this in the last little bit, how do you separate uh, the anxiety about hearing the marketing hype with what can actually be created and is useful um, in, in our institutions? I'll let that float over our panel for a moment. I can see the wheels are turning in Aaron's mind. I start every <laughs> workshop about AI with a quote from 1985 that talks about um, how if you're not talking about AI, you're going to get left behind. And there is absolutely every call for papers, every session that is like, we got to talk about AI. We have to rewrite our strategy. I actually do think we need to rewrite our strategy. I would take a different approach than U of T as a tool. I think it is a fundamental um, to our sector, to education. The hype around like, are we going to get to general artificial intelligence tomorrow? Is it going to be six months? Is it going to be two years? If the tool stopped developing today, it would still require in education 
a radical rethink of what we are teaching, how we are teaching it, how we are assessing the opportunity for personalized learning, that sort of two sigma problem that we've known about personal tutor and the effect of um, personalized feedback for decades. AI can do that at scale in an industrial model of education that you cannot do in a 600 person classroom. How do we take advantage of that alongside considerations around the environment, around labor, around disruption to the workforce, around the labor of our faculty and our teaching assistants, that who cares if the technology gets better, stop today and rethink everything, maybe. Anyone from the panel want to build on Aaron's perspective on that? I'll jump in for a bit, Laurie. Sure. Um, I think, I think Aaron absolutely nailed it. She said what I wanted to say, so damn it. Uh, but that's what I was going to say. What Aaron said. <laughs> I'll build I think on that that's and say that. Man's guys. I'm just going <laughs> to just teasing. Oh, it's it's Aaron explaining. She does it better than the rest of us. Uh, but okay. So the other thing I think of is that there's still a reticence to try. There's still a reticence to kind of just pick up something and work with it and get a sense of it. And I think you need extended period of, of really uh, several hours worth of work, you know, take your discipline and think about what questions can I ask it? What doesn't it know? What can it answer in the, you know, in the, at the level of an undergrad student, what, what can it answer at the level of a mildly competent grad student? You know, you have to have a sense of that. You can't, you can't imagine what you need to change. You can't imagine what the possibilities are without getting a sense of what the, you know, what these things are actually capable of at the moment. And the only real way to do that is to cut through the marketing stuff and just try it out. It, oh, it looks like Pat wants to jump in there. Thank it, you, Nick. Over to you, Pat. Yeah, I just wanted to add two things. I think, I think Nick's um, comment about just jumping in and giving it a try is really important. And unfortunately, I think a lot of instructors are super burnt out because they were asked to do the same thing with online learning two years before generative AI came along. Although generative AI isn't isn't new, we can all remember Clippy from Word, and you know he would jump around and tell us, "I think you're writing a letter." Um, so I think um, it's important to jump in and try but it's important to not just see it in your teaching and learning space. I don't think it's a secret that lots of faculty members use chat GPT to help them write abstracts, right? For conferences, for things like that. I don't think uh, it's a secret that people jump in and ask it to write a letter. It's, it's amazing what gener generative AI can do when you say, please write me a resignation letter as if it was written by Ozzy Osbourne or Gandalf or whatever else. There's just, play around with it. I think that's the most important thing. We just don't have the time, so. So making space for exploration and innovation. Uh, I think we have a question over here or perhaps a suggestion. We're doing questions and suggestions now. So if you have a resource or an idea or a strategy to share, uh, you're welcome to, to bring that as well, but over here. Yeah, so that this is more of a comment on what you were saying about separating the marketing hype from what's actually useful. And what I would say is in many cases, we kind of turn to AI as this omnipotent solution to all of our problems, when in fact, I don't really think it is. In many cases, it's just kind of manifestation of the, some of the frustrations that we have with the software that we're currently using. And I think a lot of the frustration has to do with the process. And so if we have software that can help improve the process of some of these things that we would be turning to Gen AI for, you might find that you don't actually need to pay attention to the marketing hype. And what I would suggest is rather just taking a look, not at kind of the vision that you're being sold, but more so taking a look at what are the things that you wish you could do, but can't do because of you know limited staff hours or large class sizes, and then try and find a way of kind of using Gen AI to help supplement what your staff is already doing. And I think in disconnecting yourself from what you're being sold, but more or less taking a look at the problems that you're having and then looking for specific solutions to those things, you can avoid being sold a dream. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for that insight. Okay. Do we have anybody who has a, an idea? Oh, where are we next? Or a question? 
Maybe just per, to, perhaps people could introduce themselves. I'd appreciate sure. if you would. Uh, yeah. um, Mike Justison from McMaster. Uh, question about license granting bodies within a province or a country. Has anyone experienced a faculty member uh, coming up against a licensing body, let's say for a professional degree, where the licensing body has sort of weighed in on what they would like to see or not like to see in a curriculum? Uh, yeah, my particular field is engineering. And so far, Professional Engineers Ontario has been silent on the use of AI in education. It's possible that they move even more slowly than other places. I have a recollection when online learning was first uh, on the rise in an undergraduate, they had the same question for, for um, teaching hours and accreditation. I think it might be in the same thing. I don't have any experience with that. I don't know if there's anyone here who has some insight in that or any other professional accreditation, curriculum accreditation or professional body. Any other comments on that one? I think it's a, a bit of a conundrum. Comment, like, Watch just, this space, maybe. Just quickly, Laurie. Um, oh, where's that voice coming from? <laughs> oh, there it is. It's coming from above. <laughs> Hi, Nick. He's like <laughs> he's like the Wizard of Oz over there. I need a cut. That's funny because he's from Australia. You guys know that, right? <laughs> um, I don't think there are many bodies that have got gotten down to including it in their accreditation processes yet. But I will say I do a lot of work with nursing and nursing is like right out on the front edge of this in all of the different ways that they're thinking about it. And it's partly because um, AI in, in uh, healthcare is such a huge thing that they're really thinking about it as how do our nurses need to practice carefully with this and what are, they need to, what are the competencies that they need? I would be surprised if we don't see their current um, standards changed pretty soon. Thank you, Nick. Insight on on uh, the nursing scene. Hello. Yes. So. Uh, yes. Hi, uh, Melton Pansami from yes. Seneca. First of all, I want to thank the panel for a very insightful discussion. Um, uh, it's pretty safe to say that AI is causing us to rethink what we do, how we do it, and how we evaluate it. And it, I can't help but start to think about through that process, we're really, it's really taken us to what knowledge really is and how do we impart that. And that whole process is gonna change as we, as we move forward with AI. And this conversation seems to be intensifying about AI as we move along. So any thoughts on and, and, and how we go back to the, to the foundation, to the basis of knowledge and how do we impart that? All, all the instructional designers in the room are thinking, yes, we got to go revisit, revisit those learning outcomes. And the curriculum planners are going, not to mention that, let's look at program level uh, outcomes and expectations. So it's certainly a catalyst. Does anybody want to add to thoughts on? Um, sure. I think, I mean, this is kind of getting back to something I was talking in, about before of what are your existing priorities that this might give you a, a bridgehead into talking about and I think for a long time, we've been really wanting to focus more from an assessment perspective on process versus outcome. Um, you know, there are so many great, um, you know, from a, uh, an educational psychology or a, you know, a learning theory perspective of why this is a good idea and how do we make more valid um, assessments that actually reflect um, human ability and expertise and skill. Um, and, you know, I've been working in this in this field for a really long time, and that argument doesn't always resonate, right? Like people have assessments that have been working really well from their perspective for a really long time. But now we have this disruptor. Now we have this thing that, you know, a lot of people are now starting to think that, hey, this this outcome or this artifact may not be the most authentic representation of what my students are able to do either because they're they're getting help or for whatever reason. So I think it's another kind of way to capitalize on a pedagogical conversation that we've been wanting to spearhead a little bit more uh, because it's a very, um, uh, it's a big disruption that everybody's paying attention to. Thank you, Jordan. Oh, Aaron, can I hear it? You have the, it's, it's 409, okay. so you have the final say here. 
Oh, that changes my answer. Um, <laughs> I was going to reference, there's a StatsCan report from the start of September that was estimating the impact of generative AI in particular, not just AI, on um, the Canadian workforce, estimating that 60% of labor categories will be impacted. So if you think about, we don't need a learning outcome of like describe generative AI and its capabilities. We need like a completely different set of learning goals. And your question actually made me think of a beautiful book. And so maybe that can be your homework is to go read God, Animal, Human, Machine. Um, it's a philosopher who writes about for ages, humans talked about what separated us from animals was our ability to critically think and to analyze and to create. And now that we have artificial intelligence, we're making the reverse argument. What makes us different is our humanity, our physical bodies, our embodied sense of um, our senses. And the category of understanding who we are and what the purpose of what we're trying to do as humans, let alone in um, post-secondary, is radically um, shaken. And so let it be a moment of optimism, of coming together as a sector to try to answer those questions in partnership. Is that not a perfect place to end this panel? Thank you, Erin. Thank you so much. And, and my thanks to all my colleagues, all the panelists today, Nick Online, Pat, Jordan, and Erin, thank you so much. Erin, you pulled it out for the finale of the finale finale. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you again, Lori, for moderating such a dynamic panel. And again, Aaron, Jordan, Nick, Patrick, you're amazing. So yes, you're free to go. You are free to go. Or you can hang out here too. Or you can sit right in the front row. Yes, look how full that front row is. Wow. Okay, well, I'd also like to extend a special thanks on behalf of eCampus Ontario and Ontario's post-secondary member institutions to the Ministry of Colleges and Universities for their generous support for um, eCampus Ontario and this spectacular TESS 2024 conference. So at this time, it's my honor to introduce to David Way, Deputy Minister of Colleges and Universities. David Way became Deputy Minister of Colleges and Universities in June of 2023, and previously Deputy Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism, a role he began in October of 2021. And David has also held a number of executive positions in the Ontario Public Service, including Assistant Deputy Minister of Health, Social, Education and Children's Policy at Cabinet Office, where he supported the Health and Social Policy Cabinet Committee, as well as the Central Coordination Table, much other work, passionate about building a more diverse and inclusive workplace, and led the Ministry of Finance Inclusion Committee during his time at the Ministry of Finance. Prior to joining the public service, David worked in the capital markets industry with Fiera Capital and RBC and in management consulting with Deloitte. He holds a CFA designation, is a professional engineer, and holds degrees in engineering, physics, and economics. Welcome to the stage, Deputy Minister Wei. <laughs>